Greetings to the body of Christ at large that called out assembly. I wanted to get into a, a piece I call Perceptions of Righteousness that Deliver. We're talking about our soon deliverance from this world situation and trying to show how there are those who do believe quite otherwise. They feel that we're going to go through either mid trib or post trib or whatever uh, deliverance. So uh, I'm going to bring something out that comes up out of the book of Daniel. So it's called Perceptions of Righteousness that Delivers Daniel's Mystery Deliverance of Two Groups Revealed. It's following seven pages. This is seven pages long. So I, yeah, I had thought to maybe put this on uh, audio because it's, it takes quite a bit to make a movie here, then have it downloaded, and then have it. It's, it takes a lot of time. So I'm going to give it a shot trying to make a video of this first. So the following pages don't scratch the surface of this matter of deliverance. There's a lot more that comes out later. Yeah, I believe it's enough to bring out my point. So take it for what it's worth. Now, when I ever say that, take it for what it's worth. It's I believe that God shared this with me. Now, there will be those that don't feel that God shared this with me. They figure that God shared to them what they are. They're claiming. They'll, everyone's claiming that God told them this or God told them that. So take it for what it's worth. You have to find that out for yourself. You have to decide. So let me begin here. To begin, know this fact. Righteousness is not self-righteousness. Self-righteousness performance as some believe. Romans chapter 10 nails it when it says this. Now here's Romans chapter 10. It brings out two forms of righteousness. Having gone about establishing their idea of righteousness, they have forfeited the righteousness of, of God. Two ideas of righteousness are established by Paul, comments in Romans. You'll find in this mid-trib and post-trib, a lot of those that hold to this have some form of self-righteousness performance to gain that deliverance. I do not believe that there's anything on my part other than to believe that God has established my righteousness. I have no righteousness of my own. You know, that you'll, you'll see this as we bring this out. Two ideas righteousness are established by Paul's comments in, the, in this book of Romans. I know that most of you understand this. I only hope that others come to understand this. I go into this deeper in my YouTube videos, Matters of Salvation, which in the whole series trying to show up. When yeah, it comes out a lot more there. But for now, let me go on with what I call Daniel's mystery deliverance of two groups revealed. Daniel, chapter 12. Uh, verses 1 through 4. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Talking about the book of life. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wait come to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt and they shall be wise and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they shall turn many to righteousness which I'm talking about this idea of righteousness as the stars forever and ever but thou O Daniel shut up the words and seal the book even to the end of time many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased so he's told to seal up the book he wouldn't have understood it I will now give you what I've seen in this, these verses. Please note this, how Daniel's writings jump back and forth between past, present, and future, and two different groups of people. Now, my last two videos I brought out about, you know, how we, uh, from uh, Luke chapter 21, how we had to see how many times Jesus was looking at the Jewish people, that naturalistic Jewish people. And then he's looking at way at the in the future to that called out assembly of Jew and Gentile to a whole new created being. That's that's what we're trying to bring out here. That this book of Daniel reveals this fact. He's talking to people of his day, the Jewish people. Then he all of a sudden he's he's you know, he, you see him talking about the past, then he's talking about the future, then he brings something into the present. Now, if you don't understand these flash forwards and flashbacks, like I said, it comes out in many a good movie does that. If you don't understand that, you'll get this confused and you'll put us 
in the things that don't apply to this cause out of Sunday, this second group, and that which is applied to the naturalistic Jewish people, right? One minute he's speaking of his people in the Jewish nation, then he's speaking of a called out Sunday of those in the past and future. I hope you see this because it is the key that unlocks these verses and drives home the point I want to bring out. Any, any confusion of other views of our deliverance. Understand also that Daniel himself couldn't understand this and at the end of this section of Daniel 12 is told to seal the book up to a time when there this could clearly be seen. Now, we should be able to see this today. We are <clears throat> in that age, <coughs> which is without excuse. Here's what I've seen. At that time, looking forward to the tribulation period, should Michael stand up, the great prince, which stands for your people, Daniel, the Jewish nation. And there shall be a time of trouble, Jacob's trouble, that is linked to Jeremiah 37. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Note this as well. The time of Jacob's standing up is seen as past, present, and a future event. In the day of Daniel's writing, the archangel Michael is seen in Daniel 10, 13. Uh, according from Daniel 10:13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief prince angels, came to help me. So that's the first mention of Daniel, uh, of uh, Michael, the prince. We see Michael in the past brought out in Jude 1, chapter 1, verse 9. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, thus not bringing against him a rallying accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So here's a situation of uh, Michael the angel involvement. So flash forwards, flashbacks, remember that. As for the future, once again we see Michael enter the scene. This is found in uh, Revelation 12. Verse 7, starting at verse 7. And there was war in heaven, heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a voice a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now there's a debate on the web on this matter of when was Satan cast down. Some try to say well, it was in a past event, before time, in heaven. Well, that's true. Then they try to point to some specific time in the past that Satan's cast down and trying to say he's living here among us well that's true too then they'll say well he's going to be cast down in the future here's where this thing of flash forwards and flash back come in, come in handy I put it this way which will probably come out in another video under another subject I'm dealing with Satan he was cast down he is being cast down and he shall be cast down now in the framework of time now, past, present, and future is seen many times in one verse. He's talking about an event that occurred in heaven, which was this instantaneous, you know. When that occurred in heaven, we came put into a you know, split second, you know. Iniquity was found in, in Satan. In that split second, God dealt with it. And how he dealt with it, we see it expressed out in past, present and future events all in one second now God dealt with now there was no long drawn out process when Satan fell he fell and God dealt with it instantly and it did not interrupt with God's uh, continuity of what his ultimate intent is which comes out in my uh, series the ultimate intention of God there is no break 
in God's ideas and his mind we see it expressed in time space and material world of this drawn out 7,000 year period of how God dealt with the iniquity of evil I mean it didn't have it didn't stand a chance I like what a, what a minister said that one time when he said he, that he would send it to high that he'd be like the most high God that he would take on God he could send his saddle home <laughs> it didn't it didn't take much you know it was done instantly as far as God concerned the sign sealed and delivered this will come out here in a minute to how you know we see it as a disruption a break and continue but in God's mind it's it's going on it's you know often finished and he's going on beyond this fact but you have to deal with it because we're into this experience so you got to get people to see what's happened what's occurred and how God solved it like I said God before the foundation of the world knew there'd be a problem he solved the problem and he he's about going on in the ages upon ages and we're still hung up and looking at the past, we're looking at the present, we're looking at the future, millennial reign of Jesus on earth. God's beyond that. You can't get people to, I, I get into these matters beyond this millennial reign of Christ. There, There's things we should get into, but you can't get people seeing that because they're too occupied with their nose into the present situation or why it's happened in the past and some fear of the future. If you get into heavenly places with Christ Jesus in what I call the now, you can see past, present, future in one glance. And there's confidence in that. So let me read on here. Uh, going on now with more of what I've seen in this Daniel text. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, your people, the Jewish remnant, right? This is an event which occurs during the middle of the tribulation period which speaks of tribulation that this world up to this this moment had never seen so this word tribulation is to the extreme can you imagine it getting any worse now we have old people trying to jump the gun saying oh we're in the middle of tribulation or something like that can you imagine it getting any worse it says here uh so uh this word tribulation is to the extreme can you imagine it getting any worse shall be delivered you read of their this deliverance in revelations uh, 12 14 now he's talking about his people like i said jesus was in uh, luke 21 looking at the jewish people then he's looking at us and he's look now here daniel is addressing his people that jewish nation that were in bondage at that time in babylon and to the woman this is revelation 12 14 this is looking in the future and to the woman jewish remnant these Jewish people that accept the testimony of the 144,000 sealed Jewish witnesses of Jesus being their Messiah. Now, there's all kind of controversial on that. I, I, I hope to get in there probably in another piece, maybe in this video, another video, that deal with his 144,000 witnesses, and they are Jewish witnesses of the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 of each tribe. Now they ain't Jehovah Witness, and they or they aren't, as some say. Uh, uh, we, the American people and the British, make up the lost uh, ten tribes of Israel. Now that's under Armstrongism. That's you no, know, we are not those. Now they may very well be those who don't know that they're they are descended from a Jewish uh, nation, national Jew. Well, I, sorry, I don't want to get in that subject here. That'll come out in another video. Uh, uh, so, uh, these Jewish people that accept the testament of the 144,000 sealed Jewish witness of Jesus being their Messiah. These Jewish people who do not accept their testimony will perish by the hand of Antichrist. We're given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she is nourished for time, times and a half time, the last three and a half years, from the face of the serpent, three and a half years, the latter part of the seven year tribulation period. There are others that teach something different, in which I'm trying to mention that, leading you to believe that this is the only way of escape for us. You know, I, have, I know a guy does that. Uh, staying for the tribulation period, and you have to all fly to Jerusalem and join this remnant that's called off into uh, Petra, the city of Petra in the Jordan 
you know, <laughs> that's there's going to be a skate ball you know, for Shocker if you want to hang around for that event. Remnants to escape to God's prepared place for them. They confused the two groups, which I'll get into again. Again, I won't develop this here. I plan on sharing this on YouTube in the future under the title, The End of the World as We Know, The Lids Open. So that's another whole series I'm bringing out. So let me continue now. And now know how Daniel's focus switches to another group other than this end time Jewish remnant. And here he says in his next breath, everyone that shall be found written in the book, this book of life, past, present, future, beyond the writing of the book of Daniel, everyone found written in the book of life. All right. Daniel proves this in the next section of this uh, chapter 12. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? This links to 1 Thessalonians 4.16, the rapture. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, the atmosphere just above the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. In other words, don't allow any other teaching of a mid-tribulation or post-tribulation rapture to upset you. Where would the comfort be in our going through half or all of the time of tribulation that the world has never seen? Imagine that. Going off and go off and read the debates on this, which are, and find out which one needs to give you comfort. Now, show me your debates. And show me where the comfort is that's going to mid-trib or post-trib. I personally have debated it, and now at this point in my life, see where there is no debate. Either our deliverance is accomplished by our human efforts, righteousness, self-righteousness, or it was accomplished by Jesus' effort for us. How shall you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? How great does it get? Before the foundations of the world, in my series, the ultimate of God, I revealed this fact. How before the foundations of the world, God has established an escape. He saw the problem, he gave the solution, and he's trying to introduce that solution during the midst of the problem in Genesis chapter 3 of Christ slain before the foundations of the world. The injustice that was served all humanity was accomplished by God. We in of ourselves could never accomplish this justification which we need to have. The Holy Spirit brings justification, then He does His sanctifying work, then He glorifies us and gets us beyond this mess back to the ultimate tent of God where there's no breaking and, and continuity and we get beyond the problem, gaining the solution and continue on. That come out in my other series. Now back to Daniel chapter 12. Some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now here it is and it flies forward and flies back again. Here again you see Daniel focuses circus change in his writing. Some to everlasting life. This is the first resurrection which is the rapture pre-tribulational rapture, I'll bring that up, which is brought out in Revelation 26. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection of such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That's during the millennium. So understand now, during the past, the dead in Christ, we know that. They've died and they'll be resurrected. We know that through Christ. We know in the present, there are people presently dying. They'll die and be resurrected at the rapture. Now there's this question which people really get it fouled up because if you don't see now and understand something about the now, that during the tribulation people, there will be those who will die during the tribulation. Now, if, if they're, they're, they're saying this. Now, if the first resurrection is this rapture, pre-tribulational rapture that you guys are talking about, what happens to these people that died? Did they miss? Did they miss the resurrection? No. In the light of now, understand past and our future, the seven-year tribulation period. Let's say the seven-year tribulation period. 
those who have died, those who will die, and those who are alive in the present are brought together into the now. At that moment, at that day, and at that hour, in the light of God's idea of past, present, and future in one glance, He brings all the dead in Christ, past, future, and those who are yet living up in that rapture. That covers that. If you don't see that, uh, I'll try to diagram this and as I'm making this video. I'll, I'll edit it and I'll put the arrows and all, like I did in the last video. You got to see that point. In the light of that, it makes some sense. And that's why you can see a pre-tribulational rapture or the first resurrection. So we see the first version. I deal with those Gentiles who I deal with those Gentiles who received the message of the 144,000 Jewish witnesses during the seven year tribulation period. Also those left behind in another article which I kind of touched on right I just shared with you. These will die during the tribulation period and are those under the throne of God different from those that from the tribulation. More on this later. I'll bring up more on that later. Uh, Daniel's insight. And some to shame and everlasting contempt is jumping ahead beyond the thousand year reign of Christ on earth to the second resurrection. You can see it in Revelation 20 verses 6 to 15. These nine verses reveal the second resurrection of those who through all human history rejects God's way. Thus are blotted out of the book of life the time period is revealed in verses 20, verse 7. And when the thousand years have expired, in verse 20 to uh, chapter 20, verses 12 to 13, you see this matter of Christ's righteousness versus self righteousness. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. Self righteousness. And another book was open which is the book of life, Christ's righteousness, and our accepting what he accomplished, not of our own human efforts. Those with Christ's righteousness, not their own, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things that were written in their books. Here they are, at the end of this tribulation period, at the end of the millennial reign, the dead and the, the, those outside of Christ from the beginning of history to the end of the consummation of this age, at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, they're walking under heaven with their book under their arm, and they're going to stand before God, and God sees them coming, He looks at the book of life, and He closes the book of life. What He accomplished, and He says to them, well, let's, now let's see, let's see what you got in your book. How did you perceive your idea of gaining my favor again? And I opened up their books and they will be judged out of their own ideologies of righteousness. Imagine that. I would not want to stand before God with my book and ideas of righteousness. I want to go with a righteousness that's not mine, but is copied through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world. That's my righteousness. Not my ideas of my good behavior. It would not stand. As David said, O oh Lord, if thou wear transgressions, who would stand? Not a one of us would stand. I do not. I thank God that in the book of Colossians, it shows you how you take my ideologies, my iniquity of my parents visited me, and their opinions and ideas, cultures and creeds, and I took that book, closed it up, and take that book, and it's nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ, and it's covered with the blood of Christ having no righteous no, and therefore of my own, but his. That's the book you want to be found in. In that book, if you take and go with your ideologies of how to gain God's favor, you have just blotted your name out of the book of life. Now understand this, this is not a piece that comes out later. If your name is blotted out of the book, it had to be there to be blotted out. When was it put there? It was put there before the foundations of the world. So let me go on here now. Another book was opened, those with Christ's righteousness, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave the dead which was in it, and the death and hell delivered the dead which were in them, and they judged every man and they were judged every man according to their works, their ideas of salvation and deliverance. Understand it is their books that condemned them. 
their ideologies, beliefs, which rejects God's free offer of unconditional love and mercy. By your words are you justified, by your words you are condemned. They either, in their books, have thrown God out of the pictures altogether, or have done away, gone the way of Cain, thinking that their self-efforts could ever gain God's favor. I deal with this at length in my other writings. So I go on and down to 12. And they shall, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Read Matthew chapter 25, the 10 versions, you will understand this. Five were wise, five were not. The oil for their lamps mentioned in this parable is the oil of the Holy Spirit's teaching of Christ's righteousness, thus preparing us for his acceptance at his coming to deliver us. Reading on to Daniel 12, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I've said all the above to get to this single point. Those that turn many to righteousness, I have spent most of my life learning what this thing of righteousness is. In just about all that I write, I stress this. I do not preach a self-righteous message of deliverance by so-called good works to gain God's favor to be delivered in any sense of the word. I teach the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. By this I mean that which he accomplished to deliver us all from an injustice dealt out to all humanity which place all under the wrath of God. Because of what Jesus accomplished, you are not under God's wrath, thus will not be part of the tribulation period, which will be a time of God's wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world, also have turned to self-effort, human efforts to deliver them from any situation. This includes the secular and religious worlds. With this you understand, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us under wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other escape of God's wrath. God's work would never, good works would never accomplish this. One more ending thought. First or second Thessalonians 2 6. And now you know what withholds, keep these events from happening. Withhold that he, this Antichrist, might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he who now lets, lets, these things occur, which we read in headline news, until he's taken out of the way. In other words, his working of creating a called out Sunday is finished. The time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Then God, through his angelic host, will deal with a Christ-rejecting world. But then, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the works and seal the book, even to the end of the, the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. In the closing remarks of Daniel, he's ordered to seal up his book. The angel, knowing that Daniel would not fully understand what was just given, he might have some idea of this time period, but for the rest, which we today can understand, he could not have understood it. This matter of the called out assembly, which we call the church, was a mystery to him, a mystery that God reveals to Paul the Apostle later in the New Testament. I will end this for now. Though I could go on, this is already six pages long, and it develops my other writings if you desire to know more, Paul. I mean, how clear can it get? Go off and read these other writings of mid-trib, post-trib people, and find out that a lot that they teach is based on self-righteous efforts and not based on the foundation of Christ's claim before the foundations of this world and his righteousness, not my own. And my name being in that book because of that and not my taking it, my name out of that book and betting on my book of my ideologies of how to get into the kingdom of God and standing for God and God closing that book knowing your name is not there and he doesn't know you because it's not there and you opening up your books and trying to say, well, look, God, here's how I saw it. You know the answer to that. God bless you.
I have to uh, add these uh, closing remarks because there's an issue I'm sure will come up in the mind of people about this matter of the wrath of God. Coming out in First Thessalonians 5, 9, we read, For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now those of a mid-tribulation persuasion feel that we can go through the first three and a half years of the seven years of tribulation brought out in Daniel and the book of Revelation. Their reason being that the second half is called the Great Tribulation. Thus, the first three and a half years would not be considered the wrath of God. I want to bring out something I've just seen that I and others may have not considered in light of what I've been sharing. In this video of the two views of righteousness, I know, coming from a pre-tribulational background, that we have always said that what I, that what 1 Thessalonians 5 9 says, reveals we are not under God's wrath, thus would not go through the whole seven years, believing the whole seven years is God's wrath. I believe now that it's, it, this is a misunderstanding of this matter of wrath, and how we are delivered from his wrath before the foundations of the world. Being born to the fall of Adam, mankind was born under the wrath of God, all men. Yet as I have brought out, and this is and others, this injustice was solved by God to the eternal reality of Christ being slain before the foundations of the world. Thus we were justified. With all that said, to refresh your mind, let me now show you what, I, what I've seen. Those raptured before the seven years and those who are left behind and must die are all raptured in a moment of what is termed the now, which I've tried to bring out earlier in this video, which embraces the dead in Christ before this rapture, that's our history, from the dawn of history up to the day of the rapture, the dead in Christ will rise for those who are dead in Christ during the tribulation and then those who died during the tribulation period. And finally those living in the present who are alive and are all are gathered together in a moment of now. The question would be as to why are there those in the present who are alive and changed in the twink of night who do not have to go through tribulation for at all the total seven years. Now follow me on this. Our coming to comprehend that our salvation is not based on our performance but based on our being justified before the foundations of the world thus no longer under God's wrath, had a lot to do with this. So let me uh, explain what I mean by that. I've said over and over again, you'll hear this many times, by your words are you justified, by your words you're condemned. The justification is the places as though you were never born through Adam. The very fact that you being born through Adam put you under the wrath of God. And to our mind, that would be considered an injustice, which it was. But God being just and the justifier sent his son in our place correcting an injustice against humanity. So none of us have an excuse. We can't use the injustice served to us and putting us under the wrath of God on Adam. God before the foundations of the world, which is brought out in my series. The All Intents of God also is brought out in a, uh, another video I brought out called Breaking the Chains of Our Bondage, Names in the Book of Life. In that video I brought out, I'll just give you in brief, for those who have not seen that video and just read this one, that every name of every man, woman, and child who have ever entered his life in this experience was placed in the book of life. We, by our own choice, from the age of accountability to the age of death, have to make a choice. To either keep that name in that book or have it blotted out. You'll see this in scripture, as you search scripture, the word blotted out. Look it up. Blotted out. Something to be blotted out means there had to be there at one time, or it could not be blotted out. The names were put there, and the question was, 
when were they put there? They were put there for, for the foundations of the world. Look up everything in a, a good concordance uh, before the foundations of the world. Check that out. You'll see that. The names were placed there. Well, God can't blot it out. God made his decision, and his decision is clear enough. He was not willing that any would perish. It's always been his will. It's not been the will of men. For whatever stupid reason, why would you, like I said, why would you want to reject God's love for you before the foundations of the world? And manifested 2,000 years ago in time and space. I mean, you can't. It's like God put it on the movie screen for you to see. So from this point, without my notes, just from off the cuff, I want you to think about the thing of tribulation and the wrath of God. Those that are pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Think about it. Come around. Let's reason together. Okay, you look at things like the Oklahoma tornadoes. We look at worldwide floods, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, sinkholes. Everything we see happening around us today. Some are saying, well, we're in the tribulation period. You ain't seen tribulation yet. This seven-year period, when it begins... It will be far worse than anything you have ever heard on uh, uh, mainstream media, alternative news, or anything you've picked up over the web, or seen, or experienced. You know, like, if you don't live in, didn't live in Oklahoma, and didn't go through that tornado, you just watch it on the news, eat your, eat your dinner, and then turn off the TV. Very little effect on you. And then you would see a tsunami in Japan. That's way over there in Japan. I mean, it doesn't really affect you none. Unless that radiation reaches us, you know. That's long term. You may not experience that for years down the road here. I mean, a thousand different things going on in this world today, but not at such a, such a degree that you would even begin to experience it. So that's why you see today many people don't want to hear about the end times and laugh at you, think you're stupid, that you're overreacting. And that all you're doing is compiling natural disasters worldwide into a video and trying to scare people into coming to know Jesus. I mean, we were warned that things would increase. That we are, without doubt, living in the birth pangs. We've been living in the birth pangs for some time now. For centuries. Decades. And it's increased. The key word to that whole text in Matthew 24 is about the increase of these things. And Jesus is plainly saying, well, the, with the increase of these things, it won't necessarily be the end. It won't be the seven-year tribulation period. It's just the beginnings of these things, like preludes to what's coming. Now, when you get into these seals, the trumpets, the bowls, the judgments coming out in the book of Revelation, the first thing are the seals. I mean, how many people really know what are the seals I and mean, what are in the seals? No, I don't want to, this is my reason to do it right now. I'm not going to do that. It might be brought out in another video where there's plenty of good videos on the web that you can get a hold of to find out what's, what occurs during these breaking of the seven seal judgments. Understand this. We have heard of people dying, like 200,000 people dying in Haiti or better, you know, and the hundreds of thousands that died during the tsunami in there in Japan. We hear of earthquakes, volcanoes, and people dying by the hundreds and by the thousands, right? And then we look back in history and we see the over a million Jews dying during the Holocaust. Now, we can't really fathom when it says one third of men die. We can't imagine it. Take one third of what we know the population of this world to be today. Seven billion people. What's one third of seven billion? Well, three and a seven is a what? Two, two and a half, something like that. Somewhere in the neighborhood of, what? Two billion people? Can you imagine that? Not millions. Not thousands. Not hundreds. Two billion people. I mean, if you don't, if you're not touched by two billion people being dying all at one time under tribulation. I mean, I don't know, what planet would you live on? You, know? <laughs> you, you can't miss that event. 
we can sit there and watch hundreds of thousands of people die in Haiti and may not be really affected because it's not happened here in New Jersey or Miami or in California. It's not happened around here. But when that event takes place, you have no doubt that you're in the tribulation period. You're not in that tribulation period now. If you can show me some newspaper article where two billion people have perished, then I might listen to you. You can't show me that right now. You're not in the tribulation period. Now, that's the first three and a half years of the tribulation period where one third of mankind died. Now, it doesn't end here. Here's what they call the Great Tribulation. Now, the Great Tribulation is the midpoint of this whole book of Revelation and then the seven years of these tribulations. It's called the Great Tribulation because the Jewish remnant is taken and hid by God in a place that he prepared for them, that Jewish remnant. As for those who are Gentiles and uh, Jews that didn't believe in God to begin with, it was just a form of religion, a form of godliness, they will be dealt with. But in that first half of the seven years, that three and a half years, if there ever were a second chance a last-ditch effort for God to retrieve and save as many as he can. Like I said, he's not willing anyone perish. Have come down to a real decision on the part of the individual. In the last half of that tribulation period, that's the final decision these people who are left with, who stay for that great tribulation. I mean, <laughs> they're going to definitely die. But prior to that, three and a half years, a lot of people... We didn't understand this thing of tribulation, didn't understand this thing, this matter of God's wrath. They're not necessarily going to be under the wrath of God, but pressures brought about by God, which we don't understand. There's an old expression that says, love and reality many times a harsh and dreadful thing compared to our ideas of love and dreams. It's God's last effort to win those to himself. And there's Quite a few that get saved during that period. They realize, you know, whatever reason, they come to realize the mistake they'd made. Based on their performance, they stay here. I've had that said to me just lately. They'll get what they got. You'll get what you got. By your words are you justified. By your words you'll be condemned. You don't want to go with your own self-righteousness now. I would not want to be here during that tribulation period. Think of it. There's your kids, say, beyond the age of accountability, teenagers. And they come in there and they want you to recant of your Christian views of Jesus. And you want you to embrace the new world religion. If you don't, they're not going to kill you. They're going to line your teenage children in front of you. And say, either you recant, we're going to kill your kids. What would you do? It'd be hard. You'd have to let them kill your kids because you could not recant and take on that mark and join that new world religion. But what they're going to do then, they won't kill you. They'll kill your kids and they'll let you live. And you'll have to live with that during that duration of that period. I mean, that'd be horrible. Think about it. You might want to commit suicide. <laughs> Some people probably would. I, I don't want to be, I don't, I don't even try to entertain these thoughts because I know without a shadow of doubt I definitely won't be here and it sure won't be based on my performance and my self-righteousness. It's based on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Like I said, you'll get into anybody who really holds to a mid-trib or post-trib view, get into their doctrines of salvation. Find out what it is that they believe, how they gain their salvation. It's usually based on some form of performance. I can say over the last 46 years of my life, I've had all these questions in my mind. All the questions I've encountered on the web, my own questions, about what's going to happen during this tribulation period. 
I said for a time period, I put it out on it. And I got, you know, I preached it for years. And then I finally got to the point like you, you know, you get discouraged. Thinking that uh, the Lord delays his coming, you know. Of course, the scripture says an evil servant says that. You know, you don't want to think that way. And at some point within the last ten years here, I picked it back up and got back into it. It's, you know, like I said, and then also I brought out how I, I'm going full circle. At some point in, in getting back into this, I kind of thought maybe this mid-trib uh, deliverance was possible. And then, considering that those who are heading to uh, post-tribulation, that we have to go through the whole seven years, you know, I got in and out with this, uh, I found too many things said, said to the contrary. Of course, they were trying to say, well, we figure we all have to be purged and we all have to die during that tribulation period. We just won't be able to take the mark and we'll all die. Now, that, there's a point I wanted to bring out here. What I get in, I don't believe that. No. I believe people will die during that time and for that very reason. But not in the light that they, they believe that that's your only way of deliverance, your way of escape. Or some have, you know, getting up, got into this idea that we're all going to fly to Jerusalem and when that remnant goes off in the wilderness in Jordan, we're going to join them. I, know, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> How are you going to end up landing in the airport? Now understand that same text that he delivers that remnant and, says, and because the Antichrist can't touch that remnant and God protects them, he turns around and comes after those who had followed their convictions of Jesus. Now to understand that remnant come to understand from the hundred and forty four thousand witnesses, Jewish witnesses, that they that Jesus was their Messiah. And it's that small remnant that embrace that and see that. And God protects them. And the reason he's doing that, because he's going to in the next thousand years after this period, fulfill all his promises to David. The throne of David and the kingdom that God had offered them, that they had rejected the king and the kingdom and it had been postponed for some 2,000 years until the, at the age of the Gentiles has run its course. Well, at the beginning of tribulation, the, the age of the Gentile has run its course. And in, during that tribulation period, as I brought out in Jeremiah, it is a time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time of God dealing with the Jew, getting them to see the Messiah that they rejected to the testimony of 144,000 witnesses and embracing that kingdom. And when God says, get out of Dodge, they get out of Dodge, or Jerusalem, and they go off in the wilderness and God protects them there. And the Antichrist turns around, because he can't get to them, goes after those Gentiles that had received the message of what the 144,000 were saying. They bring the proper message of the Messiah and what he accomplished. And when that accomplishment began, it began before the foundation of the world. It's called the eternal gospel. Look at it up in the book of Revelation. It's called the eternal gospel. What's the eternal gospel? You know, you ever heard anybody preach on that? It's Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, which comes out in the book of Revelation. That's the eternal gospel. It comes out in the book of Revelation as well. You know, I'll, I'll probably post it up on the screen as I edit this and I'll put it on the YouTube. You can look up this text. Look them up. The eternal gospel. It's always been God's will that none would perish. Now you get people who go off and say, God's going to save us all. Yeah, he did. But if you reject what he accomplished, you want to go off with your own ideas of salvation, like I brought out in Romans chapter 10, having gone about establishing your righteousness and the idea of God's salvation and deliverance, you forfeit, you can't stop this eternal gospel of God's will before the world ever began. Like I said, before there was ever a problem, God addressed, knew it, God addressed the problem, solved it, Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. And he proves it by manifesting what he accomplished before the world began some 2,000 years ago. We look back at it, where those in, in uh, doing it, uh, uh, Daniel's time look forward to that day coming. They look forward to the Messiah's coming. I mean, that's, that's the pivotal point of it all. It's like a cross. A cross is past, present, and leads us to the future which is outside this realm into what's called the now so God embraces the past those in Christ he best, uh, embraces those of the future that have received Christ and those who are yet living 
And in one resurrection, which is the first resurrection, there's no second, third, fourth resurrection. There's one resurrection, and that all occurs in what God calls the now. Anybody that dies in Christ in the past, anyone who will die in the future, and those who are yet living are caught up in that first resurrection. Now, the second resurrection, which is brought out in the book of Revelation, is not until the end of this thousand year reign and completeness of God's fulfilling his promise to the Jewish nation of Israel, son of David, the kingdom. That's, uh, that's a whole different story. You, know, you don't want to be part of that second resurrection. That's what you use your book under your arm, which I brought out in other, uh, you know, the other video I brought out. You don't want to stand before God opened up your book and have him close the book of life because your name's not in it. Because you had decided not to go with what he accomplished, but what you want to present. Your ideas. How to gain God's favor. Well, there's so much more I'd like to say on this. probably come out in other videos. But let me end on this thought. It comes out of the same book of First Thessalonians, chapter two. So I go on notes here. First uh, uh, Thessalonians, chapter two, starting at verse thirteen. These Thessalonians, this called out assembly from the Gentile world, that church, were being hated of their countrymen for their beliefs, just like the Jewish called out assembly were being hated of the Jewish self-righteous religious crowd. The Jewish element had hated Paul for even speaking to these Gentiles. It says that in 2.16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Now see what he says in the next verse. To fill up their sins always, for the wrath is to come upon them to the uttermost. He's speaking of Jew and Gentile. The Jews were hating the Jewish Christians and the Gentiles were hating the Gentile Christians. And he's speaking of Jew and Gentile in that light and what he's called the wrath to the uttermost. That, my friend, will be the great tribulation. Wrath to the uttermost. You definitely do not want to partake of that. But if you're here for the first half of that tribulation period, understand it's by the hand of God. It's not natural cause and effect going on in the world that we see today. Now, people are trying to say, well, this is the wrath of God upon us. We're not gonna, I'm not going to get into that debate right now. There's times you could definitely say it is the wrath of God. God's angry, upset with a nation taking some of the things we're doing, changing the laws like we've done this lately, uh, uh, removing the fact that male would have one man to one woman changing that to partners now anybody can get married you know it's why you better marry your horse your dog you know now you got people that had, now that the the gays have got the given their rights now there there are those who are pedophiles that want their rights you know it's going to get it's going to get real crazy uh so talking about the wrath of god you know sometimes like uh what was it Bill graham has said that one time if God doesn't judge this nation, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah someday. While we're thinking about Sodom and Gomorrah, you've said that their cup was full. We wonder sometimes, is the cup full as far as this nation, as far as this world? How much more? How bad does it have to get? I mean, it's going to be bad. We ain't seen bad. Like I said, there are areas of this country you, you might not even know what's going on because it don't seem to be affecting you and your personal life and your town. But that wrath is being uh, being brought out. God does it on an individual level. Then he's going to do it on a nation. Then he's going to do it as unto the world. You don't want to be here when he does it to the world. That's to the uttermost, his wrath. Or what the uh, book of Revelation calls the Great Tribulation. There's so much more I want to bring out. I'm, I'm not going to end this. So this is getting rather long. And I'm going to attach this to this video. So it's going to be over 30, 40 minutes long. So uh, more will be coming out of this. So God bless.